Okay, we'll get uh, moving on our um, uh, second uh, session here this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, again, welcome to everyone that might be watching on uh, live streaming. Um, we would like to start this uh, session out by having uh, the jury each uh, introduce themselves in a very short manner so that you folks can meet them. So would you like to come up here so you can see their faces when, <laughs> when they introduce themselves? Want to, want to start? Uh, good morning. I'm Edwin Fountain. I'm general counsel of the American Battle Monuments Commission, which designs, builds, and maintains American memorial, military memorials and cemeteries around the world. Also vice chair of the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, currently developing the National World War I Memorial here in Washington. I am Herman Viola, and I'm a curator emeritus at the Smithsonian. Been here 45 years, so I'm an old man. And uh, I'm the senior advisor to the memorial. Thank you. Good morning. John Edebedge Cole, director emerita of the National Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian. It's an honor to be a part of this jury. Good morning, my name is Stephanie Birdwell and I'm the director of the Department of Veterans Affairs Office of Tribal Government Relations and I'm honored to be here and look forward to your presentation. Tatsumewi, good morning, my name is Brian McCormick. I'm an enrolled member of the Nez Perce tribe and I'm a landscape architect. Good morning, Larry Abakana, Inupiaq from uh, Barrow uh, originally and uh, artist, uh, sculptor, and uh, glass artist. Nick Maitsky, I'm Lillian Pitt from uh, Oregon and Washington with all the river tribes, and uh, I'm also an artist and sculptor, and it's a privilege to be here and to get the wonderful opportunity to listen to you. Thank you. Aloha mai kako, Kavika McKaig, Kanako Ivi, Native Hawaiian, from uh, Kaavaloa Kona Hema, on island of Hawaii, Ahiki Kealia Koi. Um, by trade, I guess I'm an environmental planner. And I'm also a traditional Hawaiian practitioner in the arts of hula, chant, storytelling, and uh, kiu alu. And mahalo for allowing me to be here. And sitting up here in the dark is Kevin Gower, who is the executive director of the National Museum of American Indian and uh, also serves as um, uh, a juror, um, alternate juror. Uh, with that, um, we welcome you. Uh, I'll give you some initial thanks for everything you've done to contribute to this understanding of what the um, Veterans Memorial might be. And we look forward to your presentation. We will um, have the full 45 minutes, so but we'll ask you to keep it, uh, keep your presentation to about half that so that we have time for conversation with the jury. With that, I will introduce Stephanie Rockneck and let her work with her team. Stephanie. Okay. Thanks a lot, Don. And thank you, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here as well. Um, let me start off, though, by introducing my team, which is a fairly extensive team, and there's no way that I could have done this without the team. This was truly a, a collaborative effort. Uh, two members of the team are here in addition to me, Peter and Herb, and I'll give them a brief introduction, and they will speak a little bit further on. Um, just very briefly, uh, Peter played an integ integral role in regard to offering aesthetic advice, has made numerous additions and corrections to the design, including input regarding the dance poses, expressions, and facial features, utilizing his background as a professional sculptor and as a Native American. And Herb, who's also here, uh, Herb Fricky, and that's Peter Jones, sorry, I forgot his last name, uh, has also played an integral role in regard to aesthetic advice, including input regarding dance poses, expressions, and facial features, as well as structural considerations, utilizing his background as a civil engineer, a traditional dancer, uh, and as a Native American. Uh, next on the list is Paul Kluvers. He's a veteran, uh, structural engineer. Erica Price, 
um, the lead architect. She played an integral role in the wall design and offered general aesthetic device. And then Jason Wells, our landscape architect, uh, and all of these individuals that I'm reading now uh, work for Akana, and uh, Herb is the president of Akana. And then um, Danae Burke, um, who's a Umatilla descendant, uh, she's working with Erica. She finalized the design of the wall, and she selected all of the wall text, uh, utilizing information from the um, Patriot Nations exhibit that was on display here, and Herman Viola's book, Warriors in Uniform. Danae, Eric, Peter, and Herb, and I also helped to write much of the text in the design report. Danae utilized her architectural training and Native American background. Nitu Iyer is our electrical engineer, and uh, for lighting, uh, we have John Powell on board, and he helped me with the Edgar Allan Poe project um, that I completed in Boston a few years ago, and the Native American Veterans Advisory Committee that Akana put together, and Herb will talk about that a little bit more. And uh, if selected, we would also have sculpture assistants, and uh, they would be recent graduates of a Native American art college, and Peter will talk a little bit more about that and also models. I would use actual Native American dance specialists to um, refine these poses. Okay, so that's the team. A little bit more about myself. I'm deeply moved by the significance and importance of this project, a national memorial that celebrates and honors the service, sacrifice, and dedication of Native American veterans, as well as their families, is long overdue. Our nation's capital stands in conspicuous need of this tribute. If I've ever felt a calling to apply to a project, it was this one. When the competition was announced last November, I drove to the museum for a site visit. While here, I had the opportunity to watch a Muscogee dance ceremony, which in part inspired my design. As I watched the dancers from the balcony, it seemed as though I could almost feel their history, their sense of community. I was confident that I could envision a memorial that would reflect the principles outlined in the competition manual not only on a general philosophical level, but also on an intimate personal level. By remaining open and humble, listening, watching, and changing, I have hoped that Native American veterans, past and present, could speak through my figures. I'm here to honor their presence. And this is one of my wood sculptures. I generally work in wood, but I also work in bronze, and that's me working on a fairly large one there, and that's probably between seven and eight feet, feet tall. It's half of a figure. Um, but that would be the scale if I had actually completed the entire figure. So let me give a brief overview of the project. I know that the judges have read this, but if there's anybody else here, this gives them a general sense of the project, and then I'll go into more detail. The Enduring Dance, which is the title of our project, honors Native American veterans, their families and communities, while educating and inspiring non-Natives. The visitor is presented with a compelling visual and textual story of Native American armed service and sacrifice. A central female storyteller figure stands in the welcome circle, inviting visitors to bear witness to the account of Native warriors who have been protecting their homeland since time immemorial. Behind her, eight warrior figures dance atop a low circular granite wall bordering the wetland. Each uniform figure represents a different military conflict and service branch. Together, they represent the diversity of Native American cultures throughout all 50 states united in the universal Native American form of expression, dance. The figures welcome the visitors into the dance, creating the sense that the visitors and the warriors are both encouraging and strengthening each other. The wall that they are standing on is inscribed with the story of these warriors from pre-contact and beyond, encompassing the obstacles, the achievements, and the continuation of the warrior tradition from generation to generation. At night, the memorial will be bathed in amber light, creating striking shadows of the fingers, figures underscoring their ethereal and timeless nature. So going from left to right, and I forgot my laser pointer, but going from left to right, let me just review um, each one of these figures. So the one on the far left would be Civil War. He would be an officer. Uh, and the, the one next to her, to him, would be World War I. Um, and uh, she would be enlisted. Um, and next, next to her, would be the Korean War and enlisted as well. Uh, and next, and the dances, that would be a fancy dance. This would be a jingle grand entry dance. And the third one uh, would be a men's traditional dance. And all of this was developed uh, by working both with Peter and Herb and the uh, Native American Veterans uh, Advisory Committee that we put together. And then in the center, just to the left of the storyteller, um, that would be a contemporary Navy SEAL. Um, and he would be an officer. 
and then there's the storyteller, and then to the right is the, um, the color guard, and that's Revolutionary War um, Army, or it could be Navy, actually. Um, and he would be enlisted as well. And then to the right would be the Air Force officer, uh, Vietnam War, and that's men's traditional dance. And then second from last would be the future. That would be a Coast Guard astronaut. Anybody can be an astronaut from the five branches, and she would represent the future, and she would be an officer. And then finally, there would be, uh, and this would be a native Hawaiian dance, uh, fairly general, um, and that would be a Marine World War II um, enlisted. So there'd be four officers and four enlisted in addition to the storyteller, just to create some balance. So the depth of Native American commitment to protecting the United States, the homeland, is made clear with a historical progression that reaches into the future while acknowledging and celebrating the era of pre-contact. Now I have in uh, parentheses the principles that we, I think applies to each one of these points. I'm not gonna read them, but I'm just pointing them out um, to you now. The memorial is incorporated into the already existing circular open space of the work welcome circle. And so the arc of the wall and the placement of the figures complements and emphasizes the already established sacred and ceremonial aspect of the welcome circle. While certain elements of the, des the design purposely reflect the circle, the dance, the drum, the orbit path that the storyteller is standing on and the medicine wheel, uh, and the medicine wheel. The cycle, the circle of life is timeless in and of itself, signifying eternity with no beginning and end. Sorry, I'm really nervous. I think everybody's gotta be uh, that goes through this. So also it utilizes and incorporates the biggest open space outside of the museum. Several hundred people can, can view and interact with the memorial at one time. If the occasion arises, it is designed to be integrated into ceremonies. And all visitors are greeted by the memorial as they enter and exit the main entrance. Also, Native American women play an important and prominent role in this memorial as veterans and healers, for instance, the World War I nurse and the storyteller, as warriors and representatives of the future, for instance, the Coast Guard astronaut, and as gardens of Native American culture, for instance, the storyteller. Here's another view, um, again, drawings. Uh, because of its figurative nature, on a visceral human level, the memorial is immediately accessible to all ages native or non-native, and to visitors from all backgrounds. Although the figures are legendary at seven feet tall, the individual is represented, allowing all visitors to relate on an intimate, personal level. This memorial emphasizes the shared humanity of sacrifice. Other than the text, the design is meant to be immediately understood by those visitors who not speak English. The language of dance and the human form is universal. The figures will inspire pride and honor in Native American visitors and respect and veneration of Native Americans and non-Native American visitors. The memorial is also designed to be viewed from all directions near and far. And here are some computer render renderings that illustrate that. The figures are meant to be viewed from behind through the wetland in the fall and winter uh, time periods uh, and by visitors approaching from the Capitol, from the side streets and from the front by visitors to the museum. Even at a distance, the universal imagery of the figures will be understandable. From almost all approaches, it's clear that the figure holding the eagle staff, the Native American flag, is standard, standing center to the main entrance of the museum, as if he's not only protecting the figures in the enduring dance, but is acting as an intermediary be between the museum, a physical stronghold of Native American culture and history, and the capital, the seat of the government the warriors swore an oath to uphold. The eagle staff also could be centered uh, almost directly on the east-west axis with the museum is, is um, placed on the east-west axis. And we could uh, make sure that that's the case, or it could be the medicine wheel is centered directly over the east-west axis. On sunny mornings, the figure shadows will also be visible from the air and will move with the path of the sun. The figures will also be visible from inside the main entrance of the museum and the second and third floor balconies. The memorial is interwoven with, and this is the, what you're seeing here is for people who haven't seen my, the work, this is a, a, a 10 inch uh, clay model. Uh, and that is um, a model of the Korean uh, Marine in his dress blues. Uh, the memorial is also interwoven with subtle details, giving visitors a sense of discovery and depth. For instance, the narrative text inspires reflection. A Southern wind blows across all of the figures, conveying a sense of hope in the face of grief and loss. A folded flag is engraved on the center of the wall to honor the dead and the lost. Each cardinal direction is gestured towards by one of the figures, 
The memorial is a very subtle compass reaching out to all times and all places. By doing so, in the Native American tradition, it becomes the center of a circle and therefore a sacred place. The storyteller stands on a morning or a rising star, not necessarily Venus because that's already depicted in the circle. She represents the past and the future, a new day and hope. At night, the shadows of the figures will slowly move as if the figures are being lit by the light of the traveling moon. The sculptures will be constructed not only with an eye for overall form, but for detail. And all of these things that I just mentioned came about from uh, a lot of discussion with the members on, on my team. This was, again, collaborative. So speaking about detail of the figures, for instance, all of the faces will have different expressions. Although, although these expressions are universal and timeless, in this context, they will also tell particular stories reflecting the complicated and rich narrative of Native American military service. And if you want, during the Q&A, we can go back to this and I can talk a little bit more about how these expressions might differ. So these facial expressions will become much more nuanced as the drawings are translated into three dimensions. So this is another 10-inch model, and this is a model of the Civil War Union uh, figure. So for instance, the scar on the face of the Civil War figure bus would make this figure more relatable and personal, although it would retain a legendary feel. So he's got a scar on the, his upper lip. Uh, and each figure um, could have details like that. Each uniform will be carefully researched in consultation with experts and details will be added as relevant. In the case of the Korean War Marine, a Purple Heart Medal has been added to represent the wounded. So this is one figure, but I, couldn't, I didn't have time to do all eight figures to model them. Um, but this gives a sense of dancing and you could imagine what it would be like with the eight different figures. They would give a sense of dance when all viewed together. And uh, I introduce Peter Jones. Hello, my name is Peter Jones, I'm Onondaga Seneca from Western New York. Um, I was drawn to this project because it has a lot of things in it that I would have done if I was doing it. This is a little bit of my work. This piece is called Homecoming and it's being installed at Watkins Glen this week weekend at the State Park. The figure here is one of, an idea for a storyteller or a medicine woman, either way. And she's holding a bowl and a fan for either smudging or offerings, prayers, healing. She represents a lot of um, our culture and is speaking directly to the, the um, the figures behind her. The lighting that is going to be used will be both during um, the daytime will be natural lighting and shadow and at nighttime I thought it would be a good idea to have various lights shining on each figure at a different angle to create a, an, an effect that would be a very kind of serene at night. We want this memorial to be a place where the veterans themselves and their families can go to heal and to uh, just contemplate. They want them to see themselves in these sculptures and We want them to feel at home when they do, do come here. These are some of the backlighting here is going to create this at night so that there will be two dimensions, both daytime and nighttime. This would be approximately what it would look like at night with uh, the backlighting on it, the different figures. 
This is one that Stephanie did in Boston for Edgar Allan Poe, and she used the shadows on that to kind of give it a sinister effect. The natural elements are blended in with the, uh, the rocks that are outside already on the, on the site. The grandfather rocks. The wind would be a southern wind, the way the sculptures are placed. In the center, we have the, uh, the flag, Native American flag, which is also the, the staff. It would incorporate a, the whole circle that is out there and bring more uh, an immediate feeling to it for people to sit, to sit and just watch or think. And the bowl we could uh, place there for any offerings that people might want to make, cedar, tobacco, ribbons, whatever. This design is from the um, Civil War. Is it Civil War? Yep. Yeah. A lot of the poses are taken from various dances that are caught midstream. Dance is one thing that most indigenous tribes have to express themselves to, uh, for healing ceremonies, for welcoming ceremonies, and uh, honoring. So we use dance as the, the main idea of the sculpture. I had uh, envisioned a home, not a homecoming, but a um, a dance where they all get together and celebrate the day and celebrate meeting people that you hadn't seen over the years. And this is Herb. <laughs> Thank you. Asia Adish, good morning. Herbert Fricke, good aha. My name is Herbert Fricke. I'm a member of the Arikara tribe, three affiliated from the Great MHA Nation. <clears throat> My Indian name is Wolfhart Shantoksha Shante. I was very honored when uh, Stephanie asked me to join her team. This project is of great interest to me. Um, not only as personally as a civil engineer, getting involved and working with an artist, there's so many things I'm learning myself, um, but also because um, the military goes way back with my tribe, back to our treaty of Fort Laramie, um, where many of my ancestors joined the army as Indian scouts. And to many, to their chagrin, we see that, but we are very proud of that um, legacy with, uh, are the Arikara, the Sanish people. Also, uh, my father was a veteran, um, and my father-in-law is also a veteran, Vietnam. He holds a purple heart, and uh, it's very dear to me. At Akana, we are a &E firm, and uh, our corporate culture echoes Native American values. Mm -hmm. And our engineering solutions are rooted in sustainability and respect for natural resources. So a project like this lines right up with what we do. I'm also a traditional dancer. So Stephanie asked me to help with some of the posing and uh, was very happy to help her with that. Some of these dancers you'll see were some more traditional, some are fancy. There's women traditional dancers throughout and Hawaiian as well, and uh, Alaskan. Um, and general layout of the design follows the circle, the arc, and as you can see, the concept is very open. 
The memorial is accessible from all angles, so it has no clearly defined entrance or exit. It's free form and represents time and memorial, that this is a timeless piece. It's also wheelchair accessible from about any angle that you can read the text on the wall or visualize the um, figures. The storyteller can be interacted with directly. You could, you could actually, public would be able to touch the storyteller, especially as um, Peter indicated, if they want to make an offering. We also thought about access in the winter. Um, snow would be very easy to remove from the um, site. It's well lit at all times, and maintenance is very simple. The design itself is enduring and will last indefinitely, and so we were trying to keep this design very much in line with the design principles. Endurance, sustainability, respect. Even from a security standpoint, uh, the memorial can be viewed from inside the uh, museum. In addition, we laid it out right along the wetland, and that also plays an integral role in the uh, design itself, serving as a spiritual home and a graceful background. And not only that background, but it could be viewed from the other side as well as foreground. We tried to minimize any intrusion into the actual wetland. So we are gonna widen the wall to about three feet wide, so it moves about a foot into the existing wetland. There are some trees, existing trees, that'll have to be removed and relocated, some irrigation and power as well. But we would use those planting, take those plantings and use them to either camouflage the lighting poles um, or place them in a uh, good location in terms of view from the um, memorial too. We're also thinking in terms of we could put down some perennial plants that could be used uh, as, that would be sacred to many tribes, either cedar or tobacco. We would be willing to work with the museum in terms of any plantings that uh, might make sense. The bronze warriors themselves are seven feet tall. They weigh about 650 pounds. They'll be anchored into a concrete foundation which we'll place at the bottom of the stone wall and the wall itself is stone. Um, we're gonna design the connections so that they're concealed, so that it'll look as if the um, bronze figures are actually standing right on top of the wall. Uh, see, his foot will be right on top of the wall. It's not practical to reuse the existing wall, basically because it's just dry stacked stone. Um, so we're gonna replace that with new stone to provide better anchorage but we'll take any efforts we can with the museum um, to relocate or reuse, repurpose the stone that's taken out of the existing wall. As Stephanie mentioned, um, we made a tremendous effort in trying to listen to Native American voices as we did the stage two competition, particularly those of the Native American veterans. After the mid-course review, Akana posted a luncheon with a Native American Veterans Advisory Group. Uh, we presented the Enduring Dance concept to them, and that group consisted entirely of retired military and veterans, both men and women, um, from the Vietnam and Iraq, Afghanistan service era. As a result of our discussions with them, we made several alterations. Uh, we added the hand drum, it's right here, and the eagle staff, representing a Native American flag. And those will be on the central figures. Um, as Stephanie indicated, we'd like to align that with the east axis in the cardinal directions of the museum. We also added the five military seals right here, and a folded flag in the center. We also adjusted some of the uniforms, the um, Navy SEAL, we took off some armor, and then we um, changed the hairstyle for the Coast Guard, more bun style, which we are told uh, veterans are very important on hairstyle, and so we've tried very hard to be very accurate with depicting that in the, in the figures. 
They made it clear to us that the figures need to feel and look more native than the stage, stage one. And Stephanie put together a marvelous um, set of drawings that you've seen. You can see some of the detail, but I'm looking forward to seeing much more detail if selected. And we're going to continue to communicate with the veteran, veteran advisory group. It's very important to us, and not only related to the sculptures, but we, we value their voice. And we believe they really need to be a part of this design. In addition to overseeing the element, other elements of the technical elements of the project, I will continue to add my aesthetic advice and integrate my own experience as a Native American. We've been listening, reacting, and changing while maintaining the spirit of the original design. Native Americans, especially veterans, are a client. That's how we really look at this. And the Endearing Dance team is here to create our best work in response to their vision. Thank you. That's the end of our presentations. Thank you so much. Um, we uh, would like to open it up to the jury for any comments, questions that, that you may have. Who's first? Brian? I'm real curious about the, the lighting. I was just wondering if it's going to be a static lighting or is it going to be more like animated lighting at night? You know, to... it, would, it would move. Um, the shadows would move. So it would be on three light poles, um, some, so, some of the lighting uh, in the wetland. Uh, Use this yep. Sorry. So um, let me go back. I'll bring up the site plan. Right. So some of the lighting would be back here, and we'd camouflage those poles. And on each pole, there would probably be about three lights. And by subtly uh, dimming them, and also um, and and, uh, and strengthening the light, it would cr the shadows would appear to move. So no lights would actually move, but the shadows would move. There would also be lighting um, uh, on the balconies up here that would provide some of the front lighting, for instance, that for the storyteller. And we would have lighting on the wall that would provide up lighting for the text and the front of the figures. But it would be dynamic, although the lights wouldn't actually move. Yep. Yes, uh, Larry, how about kind of here? I was wondering about uh, the images that uh, the dancers, uh, I think there was one that represented uh, uh, Alaska or northern uh, areas. Um, uh, the one that I saw was uh, looked more like uh, Canadian Inuit people. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, wondering if you had uh, different uh, tribal members in different regions to come and kind of view and kind of get their ideas. Right. The so pieces. you're talking about uh, him, right? Right. Uh, he holds the hand drum, and I. We didn't have any actual, um, at this stage, we didn't have any feedback from uh, people who are actually familiar with these facial features. Rather, Peter and I together looked at pictures uh, of Alaskans, Inuits, and this is a composite piece of that just to represent that region. Um, and, but again, if you know, these drawings, my drawings aren't nearly as, as detailed as my sculpture. If selected and we moved into the sculpture phase, I would have actual, I would have photographs, a whole um, portfolio of photographs of people that I wanted to represent and create a composite of that. As I did with the Civil War figure, that was, um, I looked at a bunch of photographs, so I didn't get too specific um, to create a composite piece, but yet it still represented the region faithfully. Um, my brother-in-law, let's step up to the mic. My brother-in-law was uh, Yupik from Queenhawk, and he told me a lot about he was also an Air Force veteran. So I knew a little bit about it and from him and from being at the Institute in Santa Fe. Um, the skin drums were one of my favorite singers and things, but uh, we couldn't get too tribal specific doing this. So 
we did do the composite faces. So any, anything else? So aloha mai kako. I guess I'm coming from a perspective as, as a 20 plus year uh, dancer, chanter, drummer in uh, my halal hula. Mm -hmm. And so I guess uh, big picture, the concept of the enduring dance, um, the fact that many of us as natives, like that's the means and, and ways for generations that ancestral knowledge was transmitted specific mm -hmm. to place, um, ancestral memory by which when we conduct dance, affords opportunity, not just for identity, but for connectivity and mm -hmm. in this modern world for relevancy. And so, you know, that's an overall comment. So I really appreciate the, the approach here of, of dance being the exposition of expression that can cross a lot of uh, different, literally native uh, interpretation and, and focus on a common theme of endurance through, through hardship uh, as war brings oftentimes. And that the fact that dance is used in many of our cultures to celebrate the beginnings of life so when someone has a baby to someone's death, mm -hmm. dances that means and metaphors to, to emote an expression. Um, so that being said though, um, and because you folks had taken strong steps towards providing specifics, I do have commentary on the Native Hawaiian figure. Mm -hmm. um, very specifically that um, it's more representative, back. I believe, of Polynesian. In general, uh, I'd say more Tahitian, Samoan, or Maori. It's not indicative of what I am familiar with uh, in terms of hula. Um, specifically, the lay po'o, or the, 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 uh, the lay on the head, you know, it's something that we do use, but in terms of positioning of what's shown on the po'o hivi, or the shoulders, or the kuli, or the, the knees, that's again more probably Tahitian or Maori or Samoan. For Hawaiians, we place our, our adornments on our wrists and our, and our feet, our ankles. Um, and then for me, the other big part is just the mixed media of sorts. Um, I am not too familiar other than when you're in military dress, I know there's an allowance for using a lei a'i, which is the, the lei adorned around the neck. Um, the material is not irrelevant because there's, there's symbolisms, of course, right. whether you're using mm -hmm. flower material, seed material, uh, material from the ocean like our kupe'e. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, to have the mixed media of adornments that are typically of traditional dance with military uniform, I think is a discussion that you, you still need to kind of figure out as okay. well. And then lastly, um, and this is me being a sticker, uh, is in terms of positioning and what the conveyance of the story is. Again, I only can speak to hula. Um, hula, in terms of motion and movement, cannot exist without text. So it could be an overall generalization of a positioning or pose, but to some degree, if in that pose you're trying to communicate a singular idea or thought, then to me, the positioning and pose should be indicative of, of that pose. So if it's pointing to the east, there's nuances of hand positioning being a little bit more, you know, um, uh, extended. Mm -hmm. um, the positioning of the feet, I, I'm trying to figure out if that's a, a ki'i owehe, or is it a hella? It's um, a generalization. It so, so, so but, but to the degree, though, if you're using it as a representation yep. that is of, quote unquote, native Hawaiian mm -hmm. exposition, then it needs some maturing of, some of thought. Clarifying, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I expected your question, actually. So, uh, so my apologies for being vague there. Um, it, and I, I looked at um, a fair amount of Hawaiian dancing, but I'm not anything close to the expert that you are, and I was worried that one of the arms wasn't bent. Um, but we were trying to make him relate to him the lower 48 dance to the uh, Hawaiian dance. So I had to compromise on both sides. Sure. So, but I think if selected, we would clarify that because what you're telling me now, it's kind of blurry and we'd have to bring that into focus and have, make that have real yeah. articulate meaning. And I respect that and we would, no, we would no, certainly and, do that. And I only share that from a perspective, you know, in Hawaiian we say, you know, I, I usually say, heleo vale no, he kanaka vale no, aka heo vale no. Like I'm just a voice, I'm just a person, but I do carry all my ancestors with me, so it's perspective of my teachers and training that go back generations as well. And if I didn't say it here, and if you didn't get to hear it from mm -hmm. me, then you know, to sort of allow it to continue on without sort of commentary would be a disservice to you as well as to what I, I bring to the table to represent. So I appreciate the, the opportunity to be frank and honest, but yeah. um, I do appreciate the overall aesthetic and approach that you're taking to the project. Thank you. No, we would have to change that. I couldn't live with it if it was wrong. So, <laughs> and then I guess my, my last, it's more of a comment than a, than a, than a note is in that, um, because my father who served in the army, you know, with a bunch of his friends who were, who were local boys from Hawaii, 
you know, oftentimes would play music, dance, hula, wherever they were stationed uh, in Fort Riley, Kansas and whatnot. And there is, a, there is a specific picture that comes to my mind that reminds me of the stories my father used to tell before he passed away where it's um, of a bunch of, bunch of brothers, we call them, the, the local boys hanging out in their uniform. There's a lei draped around the person's neck and he does have an uli uli or a feather gourd. That's more like a very informal setting. Perhaps they finished their shift or something. Mm -hmm. They're still in uniform but they're in fellowship with one another. And to mm. me, that's an important story to communicate too. So there are images out there and that yeah. specific image just comes from the Getty collection that you could probably find as a source of inspiration okay. as well as discussion. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Just to add on to that, we had long discussions with our Native American advisory group about the use of uniform and then adding things to it. So. We're very well aware of the, how the, as a veteran, it's very important to be a becoming and have your uniform perfect for inspection. So. Beyond, the, beyond the, the overall motif and, and meaning of dance, in the, in the individual poses and in the dances, the particular dances that they represent, is there meaning uh, relevant to the, to the memorial that ought to be taken away? And particularly for non-natives like me, how would I know that meaning? What each dance means? Uh, yeah, and the steps are the particular dance. Is right. there, is there a, is there a, we can have, for lack of a better word. Right, I understand what you're saying. So the non-native comes upon this and they don't understand the, the meaning of the men's traditional dance and maybe uh, the eagle fan that they're holding, right? Or the, the, the bowl. Um, there would be auxiliary lit literature that would um, be available for the visitor. Uh, auditory, I mean, they could listen to a tape and that could, we could go into all of those details and talk about uh, the morning star, uh, the southern wind and you know everything in addition to the dance moves that explains that to them and hopefully uh, it would be engaging enough that people would want to ask those questions and move to those different levels and not just have a selfie taken and move on right so they would be interested and intrigued enough to to go inside and pick up the literature and either read about it or put on a pair of uh, headphones and listen um, to the, the meaning and significance to all eight, nine figures because all of them have a, a would have a, a, a a lot of detail that would not be immediately accessible um, to somebody who's not familiar with that particular dance or that particular region. You've also got, you've, there's a fair degree of parallelism and symmetry between pairs of dancers. Mm -hmm. uh, how important is that to you? Uh, is there additional meaning that can be conveyed with uh, additional poses or steps that are not, that, that then sacrifice some of the symmetry? Uh, Everything in our world is based on balance. And the figures all balance in this uh, depiction. The balance is what keeps you stable, keeps your mind right. It's just very important in the, the cosmos of our thinking. And for a veteran, that has had his balance interrupted, this brings it back into place, especially with the uh, storyteller woman where they can just think about everything. That uh, the dances had to be somewhat uh, vague because of the regulations. So we kind of generalized a lot of them but they are important as a whole. I think what we strive for was that a native veteran could go there and identify themselves or any native or any person that's married to a native veteran and people that were non-natives but served with natives. So we incorporate all that and we do explain a lot of it in the uh, writing along the top of how they were involved in almost every, they were involved in every war of the uh, United States in greater numbers, 
than any other minority or any other peoples, statistically. Uh, on a different question, um, <clears throat> so I, by, by incorporating this into the main plaza, uh, you, you have a great opportunity for gatherings and, and, and larger ceremonies and whatnot. On the flip side, where do you see the opportunities for sort of private, quiet contemplation uh, in the site, un undistracted by the crowd? I don't, I hope you have a crowd, <laughs> <laughs> but when you contemplate, you can contemplate and sit quietly watching or just looking at the figures, or you can come there at a time when it's not so uh, crowded. That's why we added the lighting. It would be accessible at night and it would be, appear to be alive at night too from the shadows. So I think it would be a, a good place both for uh, gatherings of a group of people. It would be good for educating groups of students about us. And it would be good for the Native veterans themselves to see themselves honored as such. Thank you. If I can just add one thought to uh, my colleague okay. Edwin here. So, for example, we just had yesterday a uh, Kamehameha Day commemoration, and there's four statutes that are around in Hawaii and here in D.C. So that's a very public intimation of experience where there's protocol of chant. There's actually lay draping where the statue is draped in lays that are, that are made by different parts of the community and come together. It's intended for sort of a public appeal, if you will, to, to celebrate and Part of our conversation is, well, what about for the more intimate, lack of a better word, offering? If it's someone coming with a single lay, representing their father who passed away, who served in the military, and wanting that sort of intimate experience with the exhibit, may not necessarily always want watching eyes, and especially in such a public space as the welcoming circle, for that to happen. And so it's not a, it's not a criticism at all, anyway. We're, we were just having a conversation, or at least some of us, about how do you create that intimacy if that were to be an intended part of this this exhibit or not exhibit this? Just really monument. quickly, I think Don's ready to cut us off here. But as, as Peter said, I think the time of day would be important. But also, so if you look at the third figure in, this is the, um, the Marine in dress blues. These faces, particularly his, can be positioned in such a way that you can't see his face unless you come up close to him. So it draws you in close and it can create that intimate experience where you're having a relationship with just that figure. And I was at the Vietnam War Memorial yesterday and it was mobbed, but I could connect. I didn't know anybody on the, on the wall, but you can connect to those names just by coming close to them and everybody else is shut out. So I think that would be the same with the text on the wall as well. People are drawn in close and, they become, and, and they're in their own world. And you could also have a relationship uh, with the storyteller as well. I mean, she's out in the middle and she's there to greet and interact with people. Did you speak to the uh, we didn't, uh, the content of the text, um, we didn't talk directly about that. I have that here, actually, if you'd like me to read some of that. But uh, as I said, Danae um, selected all of that text and it was taken from the Patriot Nation um, exhibit and from Herman Viola's book. And it speaks to the history of uh, Native American commitment um, to the United States Armed Forces and gives a brief history of that. And it's, it is chronological, the text, because it made more sense, but the figures themselves are not chronological because we didn't want to create a sense of a, a beginning, middle, and end because we thought that would be contrary to uh, Native American tradition, and we wanted to create an idea of eternity and open-endedness. But I can certainly read some of the text if you'd like me to. Okay. I just wanted you to speak to it. Uh, I do, <clears throat> in, in uh, fairness and, and uh, equal time, I do have to uh, uh, end this session, um, Stephanie and team. Um, this is a very, very brave uh, effort on your part, I think, to create a memorial uh, like this that is so different than other memorials that we find on the mall or we find in other places that speaks to the heart and passion of the Indian world, the importance of dance, the importance of bringing people home. Um, it's, and, and 
yes, if you were proceeding to go ahead, you would have a mountain of people like these guys figuring, trying to figure out exactly the right pose, exactly the right uh, facial expression and everything else, but it would be a challenge I think you would be up to. And we thank you so much for your contribution to trying to define what this memorial should be. Thank you so much. Thank you.